Inauguration ceremony happened across the country today, but what are the new governors, uh, what about the governors who are taking over? Mm. Well, the president, Mohamed Buhari, begins his second term, and we're concerned about setting the agenda. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cohn. So the focus has been on the president, but tonight we want to look at the governors of each state. And we want to start with Imo State Governor Emeka Iheiduha. On Monday, he said he was inheriting a state with institutional decay. The governor said this in Oweri, uh, the state capital, while receiving the report of his transition technical committee. Now, joining me to have this conversation, I have Francis Chilaka. He is a, a, a global administrator and he's of the Imo Networks Group. It's good to have you join us, Mr. Thank Chilaka. You very much, Happy Inauguration Day. Uh, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we have Babashala Adegui. He's a political analyst. It's good to have you join us. Thank You're you dressed like you actually went for the inauguration. Well, I actually missed it, so wow. that's why I couldn't. Okay. That's why I dress like this. <laughs> Let's start with Emo State. This is your state. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering. He's saying he is inheriting some form of, uh, you know, rot. How true is this um, assertion? And what? Why does Mekai Hodiha, you know, say this out loud? I mean, because we have seen adverts and TV documentaries <coughs> of the Roches Okoroche government and all the developmental you know, projects that have been done in Imo State. So where is Imekai Hedioha coming from? Um, I think the problem with Imo State, which everybody knows, is that um, in the last eight years we had a governor who spent so much money doing uh, media stunts. That's, that's the way to define it. Um, practically, there was nothing done in Imo State. I'm sorry, when and, you say nothing, and, again, I'm, I'm, it I'm makes coming, me I'm coming, Yes, worried. I'm coming to that because, um, you know, I'll tell you, it, it, it pains me to say that um, a governor that has worked for eight years, only in a, a week to hand it over, you know, first of all, you come on air and you're inaugurating projects on air. It shows the height of what, it shows the height of mediocrity in governance. That is what it means. Yeah. And then you go a step further, you, you know, you... You, you are building, you say you built hospitals, you built this. These things are things that should have been in place eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So why is it that all of a sudden you wake up from sleep when you're about to hand over and you now remember, oh, I have this project here, I have to commission, I have this project, I have to commission. You know, it, it simply shows you the kind of governance we had in Imo State. Yeah. There was nothing to write home about. Well, I'll tell you one of the things. Okay. We had great, graven images of... <laughs> world leaders, and that recently the president's zone was, you know, well, let, me, let, me, let me just... <laughs> there were roads and schools and hospitals. I mean, you can't tell me that that was a publicity stunt, was have you, it? Have you been to Imo State? Uh, not while he was so, coming. So you cannot sit here in your studio... I can't verify this. No, no, you can't sit in your studio and give him pass mark for the things you see on television. Anybody can put up anything. If you remember, if you watched the program where he was um, commissioning those things, most of them, he was just showing us pictures. Um, most of them were just the architectural designs that he was showcasing. Yes. So if these things are on ground, they ought to have been commissioned before now. Hmm. So that people can actually feel the impact of governance, but people never felt it. I, I'm going to put a pause on you because you, maybe you, she's being sentimental because she's from Imo State. Uh -huh. I, I'm going to come to you. I think you, you are a political analyst, so you're going to be looking from the inside out. You'll be unbiased in your session. Let's take up Emeka Hedyuha in his statement. Does he have anything as a fact to hold on to when he says the state is, is in a, you know, some disarray and there was nothing really? Well, actually, for Emeka Hilda, we should know this is the second time Emeka Hilda is contesting for the position of governor. Mm -hmm. I think the last time was maybe 2015 or 2011, mm -hmm. and then. he lost. And I'm very sure Emeka Hilda has more knowledge about what is happening 
uh, in most states than before. Because for the past four years, after I contested and uh, he lost, and he knew that he was going to contest again, he will be doing everything possible to ensure that he has his facts to come out and campaign against the sitting government or uh, anybody that the sitting government will be bringing up. But one thing I'm yet to understand, when he said that the inst a decayed uh, institution, I look at it, what does institution mean to him? Is it the institution I know? Is he talking about governance? Because when you are talking about institution, you talk about the governance, you are co talking about uh, the state of the infrastructure in that particular state, mm -hmm. then maybe you are talking about the financial um, status of that part, because I remember uh, Okorosha coming out that is living behind 42.8 billion <laughs> naira without even telling us the liabilities. He that came up and said, come, I, 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 presently there is 100, 100 billion naira debt, and the governor has not fully paid 48 month salaries. It could be heard of this direct facto as a decayed institution. But as far as I'm from what he has said, Emeka Kayoda should not start his government with blames. You knew it before taking it up. Then you must be ready to face it and do the necessary. But is this new? I mean, take for example the Buhari administration taking over from the Good Luck Jonathan administration. Two years into the administration, it was still a blame game, and Nigerians kept saying, "What are you going to do? You campaigned on these things. Now you're here, and you're still blaming the Jonathan administration. What you wanted to do? Come back and do the job." So I don't think that the blame game is really something that we can kick off. The Nigerian system no. of government is always going to be there. No, Marian, um, I, I, I totally want to disagree with you. Emeka is not. Um, blaming. Don't forget that that um, statement was actually made when he was receiving the report of a transitional technical committee. Mm -hmm. It shows that Emeka is ready to work. He just didn't um, set up a committee for inauguration. He set up a committee that has been working in the last one month trying to capture the immediate needs of the Imo people. Mm -hmm. And now this committee finished their work and they are submitting the report to him. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the chairman of that report, um, um, uh, Mr. B, used to be the a former director of um, CBN, he did a wonderful job. And you know, it's based on that report and their recommendations that the maker is coming out to say, this is what I have, uh, you know, I have on ground. So it's not an issue. Emeka is not going to be blaming anybody. He, everybody in Imo State knows that Imo is in chaos. Imo, there is nothing to write home about in Imo State. But it is also proper for him to inform the people because the expectations on Emeka is so high. And so we need to be patient with him. We need to also understand where the government is coming from in terms of funding, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of administration. So these are all the things the man is talking about. I am not, I am not holding brief for Emeka, but I'm telling you that Emeka is not going to sit down and start blaming um, Richards because we already know that um, a lot needs to be done in Imo State. So I, I'm going to ask you a question now, Babashala. Um, looking at this um, former speaker, I think he was former speaker. Deputy speaker. Deputy, Deputy speaker. speaker. He has led the National Assembly, which is totally different from running a state administratively. Do you think he has what it takes? Because, you know, being successful at National Assembly does not necessarily equate to running a state. Uh, we know that... Um, Okorocha ran as, he ran for president several times and he didn't make it. Then he decided to run for governor, which is something that is strange. A lot of people rather leave the governorship and run for presidency, but that's not the issue. Do you see Emeka Ihedioha being able to deal with a state like Imo State, which, according to what he has said, that has a decaying institution, do you see him being able to right any wrongs, even in his first tenure? First thing first, we need to understand that Imo State is the smallest state in the whole country. Mm. And um, as a result, being a deputy former speaker has not either, let me say, either make him the best or not. But what makes a man the best is the result after, uh, after the input. Now, the best thing for a maker now is for him to get himself the best thing. Nobody has the governance uh, uh, experience until he gets to the government. Until he gets to the government. So you need to do something about getting the right thing 
to work with you in order to take the Imo State to the next level. Mm -hmm. Imo State, apart from a commercial issue, I don't think there is any other political uh, issues in the uh, Imo State. I sorry, Okorosha, yeah. I, I don't think there is any other political because I'm not that conversant with uh, what is going on uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Imo State. You get so he needs to get himself the best hand. Like I always tell people that the government is just as simple as you coming into, uh, you want to build a house, mm -hmm. you have a plan, all you just need to do is to get the architecture, this is the plan I have, put it on paper, get the best civil engineer that will, that will help you to build it, then you get the uh, the electrician that will do the, all the necessary wiring in the house. All you just need to do is the best thing that will help you to bring out your vision for the people in your state. Being that he ran on the platform of the P PDP, uh, and you know the PDP has not had the best reputation in the past 16 years, do we uh, see the people of Imo embracing him, not the party this time, but embracing him, the man, to, and giving him an opportunity to lead and, of course, reunite all of the factions that have been, you know, that have gone in different directions? Well, if you had followed the uh, campaigns, and all the intrigues that went down before uh, the emergence of America, you will know that Imo people did not vote party. The Imo people voted an individual. And they believe that Emeka is that individual that would help to unite the whole of Imo state. And like you said, yes, you cannot, as a, uh, once you're elected as a governor, the experience is not that you have an experience there. Even though, even though there's a manual, but then that manual is also uh, prepared by a human. Mm -hmm. It is bound to have um, a little bit of mistakes here and there. But the truth of the matter is, like he said, a maker needs to sit down. He needs to get technocrats to work with him mm -hmm. to be able to get Imo State to the next level. Mm -hmm. if, um, if he doesn't do that and he goes the way of uh, trying to settle people politically, he would... Uh, he will shoot himself in the legs, yes. Let's talk about your state, Ogun State. You ran for governor at some point. Uh, well, uh, now let's look at your, the, the man who's going to be governor. And the, we all know that, we know that every state has its own, you know, um, yes, peculiarity. For Ogun State, um, do we see this governor perform? Ogun had so many people running. <laughs> I mean, there were too many options. But do you, what do you, where do you see Ogun moving to? I mean, I, for me, I think that Ogun State is like an annex of <laughs> Lagos State. State. Of Lagos State. <laughs> Are there things that you think Ogun will be taking from Lagos with this new governor? Is he someone who can take Ogun to the next level, opening it up to all kinds of investments? Well, um, the new governor, uh, congratulations to him. That's uh, Prince Dapo Abiodun. Um, the truth is this. I don't always judge people at the beginning, whenever they come into power. Normally what I do, if you are coming in for the first time, what I do is I'm quiet about your government for six months. Because that six months, I expect you to have been able to roll out your roadmap and be able to let us know where you are going to. Mm -hmm. Ogun State has every opportunity to even be better than Lagos State when it comes to financial and human resources. Really? Yeah, when it comes to financial and human resources. But it's just unfortunate that uh, most of our past leaders, most of our past leaders are not seeing it. And I believe in being an industrialist, this is an entrepreneur, that he could use that his experience to uh, transform Ogun State, to revamp Ogun State into a, into a level that people will see something in that Ogun State. But I, like I always say, tell his people, and also I've also communicated to him, that the truth is this. Yes, you have won. Politicians work with you for you to win this election. But please and please, get yourself techno uh, technocrats to work with you. If you start settling politicians, <laughs> You will shoot yourself, you will get it wrong, and you will blame yourself at the end of the day. So Ogun State, the, the man has a lot of works to do. Is it education, health, road infrastructure? Talk of anything. And I also, I also want him to also, uh, not to be a sectional leader. Hmm. He's a governor of Ogun State. He's not a governor of a particular constituency mm -hmm. or a particular town. It should not be as the governor, the last governor of Ogun State, mm -hmm. who concentrated most of his development in one particular town and not the local government now. Mm -hmm. In one particular town and not the local government. 
Excuse me. Now, so it should try as much as possible to make Ogun State better than is meeting it today. Okay, talking about that, let's come back to uh, Ihedi Oha uh, in Imo State. Um, we tend to see governors doing more uh, for people in their areas. And this is detailed for so many Nigerian governors. They either they, they focus on people who they think they voted more for them or people from their catchment area. How do I know, like you said, there's no manual. How do you, how do we, the people, communicate to these people that you have a job to do and this job has to spread across all the local governments, as many as they are, not just servicing those who voted for you? Because whether those who voted for you voted or not, you have a stake to run. So for Ihedi Oha, let, let's, let, where do you think he needs to start from? Is it education? Is it infrastructure? I mean, Russell Okorja worked on infrastructure. Uh, is it the health? Is it the education? And what about resources? Because I'm going to come back to him to ask about that. For the different states, we have untapped resources that governments have refused to pay attention to. For example, I didn't know that Zamfara had gold. It was kept on the d -low. So how do we also begin to look at those opportunities that have not been harnessed? I think, I think um, it's simple. Um, the, the, the problem that has affected Nigerian in terms of governance is the fact that um, we have this, uh, our leaders have this mindset, these people voted for me, these people didn't vote for me. But one thing they forget to understand is that politics in itself is about taking care of the people, mm -hmm. providing for the people, not providing for an individual. So that is why I'm saying to America, like everybody has said to him, search for technocrats across the state. He will be doing a disservice to the state if he decides to pick two commissioners from one local government because he feels that he got more vote from there. Mm -hmm. you know. But you see, when you spread your appointment and you have a listening ear, you'll be a successful governor. But we make it sound like politicians can't be technocrats. I'll tell you what. For example, Donald Duke surrounded himself with technocrats, yes, but most of them were politicians. I mean... But they, but they worked. Exactly. So when we keep saying technocrats, it makes it look like some of these politicians are not professionals in their right. You, you know, you know the, you, let me put it this way. We have professional politicians in Nigeria. These are people, they don't do any other thing. They have no job. All they do is politics. You don't need those kind of people in governance. You need people who have, if I'm going to take you to work, you are, you're a lawyer, I know you have a chambers. Mm -hmm. So I know that if I take you to come into my government to work, you also know that you are, you have allegiance to your office. You must go back to that office eventually. Mm -hmm. But if you take somebody who has nothing else doing other than politics, at the end of the day, you find out that the person is actually going to be there to amass wealth to himself alone. So we need people who have broad mind, broad minded individuals, wherever they are, as long as they are indigenous of that state, bring them on board. Now, if you're talking about where is it going to start from, the first thing I would think America should do is to sit down and look at the plight of the Imo state workers. People cannot be owed salaries of 48 months or how many months pensioners are being owed and you think you will succeed. No. Even if you're not going to pay them all, meet them halfway, mm. give them a sense of belonging, then they will give you their best. Hmm. Interesting. Let's, that's interesting. 48 months, I have not heard that. Let, let's talk about Ogun. I, I don't know what Ogun State um, has. What's its biggest mineral resources? And, you know, for every state its own. But where are the untapped areas, like you have said, that it has, you know, the capability or the capacity of being as big as Lagos, and you know, business-wise and otherwise. Where are those areas that you think that the governor needs to, you know, begin to dig into, which would be more resourceful to him? Number one is agriculture. Presently in Ogun State, we have about 12 farm settlements. And all these 12 farm settlements, as far as I'm concerned, they have declared them um, moribund. Because it, it's been a long time that the government paid attention to those farm settlements. And let me shock you, budget goes to those farm settlements, mm -hmm. but nothing happens there. So where does the money go? Well, maybe by the time they are doing their auditing, they'll be able to answer that question. <laughs> you get it. So, they need to do something about fast settlement in Ogun State. Maybe try to make it habitable, let people show interest, do something to attract 
uh, youth or people, those that are interested in farming to come into farming. That's number one. Number two, Ogun State has Ogun State is has a, is a, has a second largest deposit of bitumen in the whole world that is yet to be tapped and is still there. As I'm talking to you, we, in Ogun State we also have a lot of large stones hmm. in Ogun State that are I, <laughs> that have been uh, broken. Whether the government is aware of it or not, we need to tap into that too. Number four, Ogun State has Ogun State is has a lot of span up of lands that can that the government can uh, set apart for industrialization. Mm -hmm. And when we are talking of industrialization now, in that particular area, I remember during the last uh, administration of Buhari, the Minister of Power actually stated that the state can generate their own power. Try to call on companies to start um, establishing power company in, in, in area of industrial areas mm. so that the, once the companies have a regular power supply, the, gov the state government will be able to generate more revenue. And before you know it, there will be transformation. There will be uh, a lot of attention to other things in that particular state. Then another thing that Ogun State has is crude oil. Up to, I'm talking to you now, there is crude oil in the uh, Ogun water side, and there is crude oil somewhere in the other place, uh, Tonga Island, it's somewhere in the Pokia, that side. So they, they have all these resources that can make them. Ogun State also, most about, let me say, 40% of people living in Ogun State actually work in Lagos State, and their taxes come to Lagos State. So the Ogun State government needs to look at that area and think of how to ensure that those that are paying their taxes in Lagos State are doing the same thing uh, in Ogun State. They have to bring those jobs to Ogun State then, because I mean, that's what's making <laughs> them pay their taxes in Lagos. So going forward, because we keep saying what government has to do, which is very important, but what about us, the people? What role should we play? Four years, uh, let me tell the words of Star Plus, four years don't work out. Uh, but we can't keep going as we used to. It's time for us to step up to the plate. If these so-called leaders don't do their jobs, like you said, you said six months for your governor. Some people are very impatient. They want to see you work in the first 100 days in office. What things are you going to change? But we ask the people, what role should we be playing to keep these people on their toes? Um, it's simple. We all need to be gadflies. <laughs> That's the best way to go about it. Um, it's not about, I don't believe in 100 days in office, um, because I think some of the things our politicians throw at us is just meant to destabilize us from the reality. The truth of the matter is that the people must begin to demand, as a matter of right, for accountability. <laughs> I mean, if the governor, now the governors have all been sworn in, I expect that by tomorrow, the, 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 the ones that are ready to work should start telling us who and who they appointed. Mm -hmm. I was actually expecting that some of them should do that today mm -hmm. so that you know, they hit the ground running. That, but for the people, we need to demand for accountability. Mm -hmm. If from my local government, somebody has been appointed a commissioner, I will hold him to ransom. I will hold the local government chairman to ransom. I will hold the House of Rep member to ransom. Until we begin to demand accountability from these people, one after the other, there will not be development in any of the states. Interesting. And David, before we go? Yeah, um, all of them campaigned before election. They made a lot of promises. And I believe it was based on those promises that they were elected. Then people should start asking them questions when they start drilling from their promises. Because once they start, there is like there is a force in the government that make people to, uh, that make uh, the elected people to forget about their promises. So they need to put them on their toes. They need to start uh, asking questions on why they're feeling. If I didn't know you, I'd think that you're one of those very prophetic people, you know, those very spiritual people that always feel that there's a spirit in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you very much, Francis Chilaka, and of course, Babashola Adigui. They're not going anywhere. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be uh, focusing our attention on setting the agenda for Mr. President. We'll be right back after the break. Thank you.